Hello, everybody. Um, thank you for joining us today for this webinar series on feeding a water stressed world, how business and investors are responding. My name is uh, Tom Williams. I'm Director for Water at the World Business Council for Sustainable Development. And together with Ceres and WRI, we bring you this webinar series. Um, these are challenging and sad times. And on behalf of the three institutions that are hosting this webinar, uh, we stand in solidarity with those who peacefully protest across the world against systemic inequalities and racism and recognize that we must be part of the change uh, that is needed. This is the second of a three-part webinar series focusing on water-related disclosure and targets for food and agricultural companies. The uh, next webinar is the same time next week and will focus on standards and collective action. Before we kick off with today's webinar, just some housekeeping messages. Um, you should have just re received a message on your screen indicating that this session is being recorded and it will be circulated uh, after the workshop. Uh, all participants, with the exception of those who are panelists or speakers, are automatically uh, muted. So if you do have a question, please use the Q&A function. You should see it at the bottom of your screen. We will make all of the slides uh, and the recordings available after today's webinar. So today's agenda, we will uh, top and tail with very brief intro remarks from myself and then some outro at the end from Sarah Walker. And in between, we have two key topics of discussion on disclosure and targets. We'll have a scene setting presentation uh, for both of those topics followed by a panel discussion. We should have around uh, 25 minutes uh, for each of those topics. Um, just as a, a recap for those who are not present last week, um, we focus on some of the high level findings and recommendations from two reports and one tool from the host organizations, WRI, WBCSD and Sears. And we highlighted some of the key trends, uh, progress and challenges around water, food and risk. Coming out of these two reports uh, and this one tool, um, we reflected on four priority action areas where if we're gonna move the sector forward and lead uh, systems change, we really need to take action as a business and investor community. Those four action areas are disclosure and targets, and that will be the focus of today's webinar. And then the second two priority action areas are around sustainable sourcing and sustainable farming practices, and particularly focusing on standards. And then lastly, around uh, collective action. And for these two priority action areas, um, that will be our focus for the next webinar, which takes place um, next week. So let's move on to our first uh, topic, which is on disclosure. And to kick, off, kick us off, we will hear from Luke Blower, an associate at the World Business Council for Sustainable Development as part of the Redefining Value team. And Luke is going to share some water insights from the Food, Agriculture and Forest Products TCFD Preparer Forum. So Luke, uh, over to you. Thanks so much, Tom. Um, so, as just introduced there, I um, want to share a few reflections on how water features within TCFD and in particular the learnings that we've uh, kind of gleaned as we've worked through a prepare a forum process with some of our leading members. So, a bit of context, many of you will be aware of the TCFD recommendations released back in 2017, of course. Uh, focused on, on improving the understanding of risks and opportunities associated with the low carbon transition and a changing climate. Um, the mandate comes from the FSB, Mark Carney, Michael Bloomberg, and then a whole range of industry leaders involved in its formation. But when it was launched, um, the recommendations of the task force, they asked us as WBCSD to provide a space for preparers, non-financial companies, from the priority sectors that the task force outlined, uh, provide a space for those companies to think about the challenges and opportunities associated with implementation and interpretation of the recommendations, uh, to look at the current status of disclosure, to think about how that might evolve over time, how we can support this sector specificity and uh, the kind of direction of travel on standardization and, and commonality uh, in approach. 
so this uh, content that you see on slide here um, comes from one of those sector efforts, the Food, Agriculture, Forest Products Prepare Forum. Um, and this report that you see on the top right hand side available on the WBCSD website was quite recently released. Um, and it includes a whole range of insights and reflections from that group and, and those companies on the bottom right hand side of your screen. Uh, and specifically, we looked at these items on the bullets here. We looked at how climate features within um, enterprise risk management processes. How can you respond to the challenging characteristics of climate risk? Uh, you know, namely, it's kind of breadth and depth, the magnitude, the uncertainty, uh, the, the dependencies. How do you incorporate climate risks and opportunities uh, into strategic planning? And especially in this context, uh, you know, for agriculture, food, forest products, how do we build this kind of momentum to positive agriculture? Think about the role of the bioeconomy, uh, think about the role of um, protein transformation. Clearly these are kind of low carbon transition enablers and there's a, there's a story that needs to be told to educate investors on these opportunities. We then looked at um, resilience and what that might mean in this kind of climate context. What are the shocks and stresses that come with a changing climate? And of course, you know, water stress is really one of those. Uh, what are the effects uh, on businesses? What could be the response? And then perhaps more challenging, what are the, the transformative changes that uh, could support um, mitigation and adaptation? We included and had some really good discussions on kind of scenario analysis processes and parameters that are particularly relevant for this uh, this grouping of, of companies, thinking about the kind of physical variables in a changing climate, and again, water would feature there, uh, as well as the kind of transition um, context of policy and um, changing consumer preferences, changing incentives, the investment approach, etc. We then um, looked at specific metrics and measures that can respond to the TCFD challenge to, to describe risks and opportunities and the response approach. And in this guidance, there's a whole range of measures building on a lot of the good work that's gone before. And again, you know, of course, will to features there. And throughout the report, uh, I think really crucially, we have these insights from credit and equity analysts from the investment community, the main audience for these TCFD disclosures. Uh, so you know, we understand how we're meeting user needs. Now on the next slide, I just wanted to give some particular reflections that have you know, more relevant in a in a water context and perhaps share some of the stories and some of the experiences of the, the companies who participated um and and this might you know seem a little odd to you actually at first because i'm actually talking a here a little bit more about the internal processes within a company uh through risk management through scenarios through um planning through accounting and how that can uh reflect challenges in a water context uh, and then of course that would then lead to disclosures but the emphasis here is perhaps more on the internal processes and this, the challenges that come from TCFD to look at strategy to look at risk management governance uh, and measurement so I think there's kind of four reflections that come to mind and I'm thinking about the discussions we had on the physical risk side and, and of course water within that and the first, accounting. This is a really interesting area because this is the challenge that TCFD has laid down in terms of understanding the financial impact of these changing variables, of a changing climate, of risks and opportunities. What does it mean for your assets, your expenditure, your revenue? And we had an you know, example, and it's publicly available. You see it in the, if you went through all of the, the detail and disclosures, uh, Store Enzo, part of our Prepare Forum, um, they've had instances where, because of drought, they haven't been able to far harvest the, the forest. Uh, and, and then you know, that leads to a provision in their accounting processes. They've had to have a disclosure in the notes and sometimes even a uh, specific accounting treatment where the valuation of that asset changes because they haven't been able to utilize it at the, in the point at which they expected to. So there's that clear connection there you know, of a, a water issue back to the mainstream accounting processes. And that's what TCFD is challenging on. Similar uh, story, I guess, in, to an extent on, on risk management and on scenarios. 
So a couple of examples that come to mind, Mondi, Nestle and Unilever, through their scenario analysis processes, they've explored the implications of changing rainfall, changing temperature, changing conditions in terms of water availability, and what that might mean for the, well, the quality of uh, crops, the quality of um, uh, the forest products, uh, what it might mean for productivity, pricing, and then, crucially, what's the response that's needed in terms of species and variety uh, you know, for, you know, for different types of um, trees and different types of agricultural commodities. Um, and then I'll just finish up on the resilience side. Um, this is, I think, an example that speaks more to Syngenta's perspectives um, through the, the prepare for and process. You know, of course, as an input provider in the agricultural systems, they're thinking about how do we provide products and services that respond to this changing climate and changing conditions, including changing water variables. Um, and, and how do we, how do we sh ensure that we have this climate smart agriculture approach, which of course then has implications for business planning, financial planning, resourcing, performance management, risk management, you know, the internal processes these companies are beginning to consider how um, how water uh, in a changing climate may be affected and the reason I haven't touched on our final fantastic preparer for a member Olam is because you'll hear from Chris very shortly but you know, they have some fantastic insights as well um, just to summarize the imperative that comes from TCFD is to think about these financial implications and of course changing water conditions has a particular uh, implication um, in that context uh, and there's processes internally within companies that can begin to evaluate develop this and of course the result of those processes can be communicated in external disclosures and in accordance with the structure of the TCFD recommendations so do take a look at the the food agriculture forest products report we actually have a dedicated session also on on Thursday if you'd like some details I can can share a link but thank you very much Great, thank you very much, Luke. Um, and that's a really useful snapshot across a, a variety of companies in the food agri um, value chain. And maybe, Luke, what you can do is um, put a, a link to that webinar that's being organized um, later this week in, in the chat box and, and people can sign up to that if you're interested. Um, if you do have any questions um, for Luke, do use the Q&A function as well, and we should have a moment to address those. Um, I'd like to now introduce uh, our two panelists. Um, first of all, uh, Timothy Dunn, uh, who is a managing partner and chief investment officer with Terra Alpha Investments. And then secondly, Chris Brown, who is vice president of corporate responsibility and sustainability at Olam International. So thank you both for joining us. And we're just gonna flip to a video view. Um, Chris, I wanted to start with you and, and um, maybe introduce Olam International before responding to the question and, and Luke mentioned that Olam is part of the Preparer Forum. Um, from an institutional perspective, what are the behaviours and relationships that you are seeing being influenced um, by water uh, disclosure? So what's some of the benefits from Olam's perspective? Hey, thanks Tom. Uh, hello everyone. Um, so as Tom says, I'm, I'm Chris. Uh, Olam is a global agribusiness. We're active in 70 or so countries around the world. Uh, more than half of those where we're sourcing or growing products ranging from cocoa, coffee, through rice, um, cotton. Um, we're in many geographies. So the, the challenge of water is, is immense uh, for Olam. Um, Again, a, a food and ag business is, is dependent on, on, on a handful of things and water is, is one of those elements. Uh, so there's no getting away from that and the challenges we, we face. Um, again, a, a business critical in many cases. Um, just the, I think the landscape behind me, uh, not, not to kid you that I'm actually sat there in Bedfordshire in England, that's uh, Chiapas in Mexico, uh, which is a landscape that was devastated by, by drought um, a few years ago. Um, as, as well as royal uh, coffee disease. So landscapes that have visited that have really been wiped out uh, as a result of challenges um, requiring different approaches. So in terms of the, I guess, the, the relationships and, and the benefits, Tom, um, by being able to move 
from measuring and, and managing to really thinking about the risks, the dependencies, uh, and then the, the change in practices that we're having to employ from, from just an arbitrary percentage reduction through to really thinking about collective action and stewardship. Uh, that, that's opened up a whole range of different conversations. Uh, so internally, uh, again, it's allowed us to have different conversations with the risk function, uh, with finance, with strategy, um, with the digital teams as well to think about how do we how do we implement spatial mapping. So it's really helped embed sustainability in the in the thinking and decision making processes within OLAM. And then externally, the the benefits that that's brought, um, we've seen through the work on sustainable finance. Um, how being able to talk about the systems we operate in, demonstrate that water's um, part of, or focus on water is part of our strategy across the business, um, has just changed the, the dynamic of the conversations with banks. Um, increasingly, the conversations are, are, are kicking off with insurers, uh, investors uh, as well this week, big conversations with some investors linked to TCFD, and insurance and again all of this comes back to water um, it's allowed us to, to revisit our, our approach with customers in terms of how we engage them on the topic so again rather than talking about an arbitrary percentage uh, reduction it's really moving to be able to communicate about the risks and dependencies as I say uh, so we can get much more context specific and then take the customer on a journey hopefully to, to identify what the actions are we need to implement and to really demonstrate um, that where their products are coming from, uh, we're really tackling the, the root cause of those challenges. And then hopefully on the, the sustainable finance, it's about incentivizing good business. So can we drive conversations with lenders uh, to provide lower cost capital um, where we can demonstrate lower risk um, and, and better practices that are tackling environmental social and economic challenges all together. So it's bringing a, a, a range of benefits to the business. But if I look back to when I first joined Oland, when we were first starting to measure, we were in an entirely different place, integrated into that business decision making. Um, and again, that's, that's not just about sustainability, it's about the business understanding where it is today, where it needs to be tomorrow, and engaging the key stakeholders in that process. Great, thank you very much for that, Chris. And, and Tim, one of the key stakeholder groups that Chris mentioned there is, is the investor community. Um, could you introduce Terra Alpha and then talk a little bit about the importance of disclosure in, in a broad context for Terra Alpha for your approach to assessing companies through its environmental productivity framework? Sure, thanks, Tom. And I, I was, well, Chris was talking about his background. I realized in my background, there's a painting in the back that people might go, well, what's that all about? That painting was painted by my mother 50 years ago, and it's just a family uh, treasure. Um, so um, the tulips, I can't really tell you who painted those. Um, anyway, Terra Alpha Investments is a public equity investment firm. We were founded a little over five years ago with a focus on how to incorporate environmental factors into investment decision making and investing to improve both financial and environmental outcomes. Um, so we look to find companies around the world that we think are best positioned to thrive in a rapidly changing world, uh, which we're obviously facing. We have a pretty unique uh, combination of environmental science and knowledge with traditional investment management experience. Um, I have a lot of traditional investment experience. I also happen to be married to a planetary geologist and have been understanding working in the environmental area for a long time. Uh, our advisory board includes uh, some pretty interesting people, including the former chief scientist of NASA, the former head of NASA, the former chief scientist of NOAA, who then was head of NOAA, who you might have heard of recently because her name is Kathy Sullivan, and she just became the first person, human, to both be in space and go to the deepest part of the Pacific Ocean. Um, she just did it this weekend and uh, brings a really interesting perspective on climate, and she's also a, a, a geologist herself. And then we also have Gene Rogers, who founded SASB, and George Serafin of Harvard Business School, who kind of help us think about um, how these factors in, in, integrate and, and are relevant to different businesses around the world. We have our own proprietary environmental and productivity assessment process that is a lot of research and analysis, um, 
but it also includes data. And like all investment research, you, you need certain levels of data. And in our case, we very much look at carbon intensity, waste stream intensity, and water intensity as the primary factors, partially because those are the most relevant but up to global challenges, but they're also most readily available. Um, we as a firm invest across all sectors because water is an issue that affects all businesses and it's a global issue across the economy. Um, but we also have a fairly large exposure to food, beverage, and ag sector. So about 20% of our portfolio is invested in 14 companies around the world it, who are exposed, who are directly in the sector. Um, in terms of the importance of disclosure, you know, as I said, it's, it's essential to any investment analysis to have a certain level of corporate disclosure. And it's, you know, we all have that across a whole range of issues from the traditional financial to, you know, business assessment in the MDA as well as a growing number of, of environmental issues. Our firm, and I think a growing number of other investment firms, and I know a number of, are increasingly requiring and expecting to see key environmental data uh, and information to help build a better perspective on any business. Um, so we expect companies to both report their direct use, water use and water purchasing and their water impact data uh, we really highly encourage companies to do a global water risk assessment and then disclose findings from that so that, you know, not the entire report necessarily, but the things that are material and that, and then how are they managing to, we're working to mit mitigate those risks. Um, I also point out, and I think, you know, Chris's comments kind of emphasize that it, as you do this analysis and reporting, it helps internally, it helps with your external stakeholders but also it helps in the broader ecosystem because when certain companies in a sector report information, it helps other companies to benchmark and to figure out ways to improve. And I understand some companies view that as competitive uh, disadvantage to disclose information, but it, if we're trying to solve these big issues, I think part of our responsibility is to be open about the opportunities and risks that companies are finding and then share those with colleagues at other companies who can help improve on those. Um, and then I'll just finish by saying, you know, we're, uh, Luke was highlighting some reports. We've written a report called Navigating Rough Water, which is freely available on our Terra Alpha Investments website, which really talks about the business case for an investor case for using and with, around the issues about water and water risks and why they need to be understood at both the business level and the investor level to improve outcomes. Uh, so I just encourage people who want to take, take a look at it to grab it off the website it uses a lot of examples of companies who have done a good job and bad job and it highlights organizations like many of the ones sponsoring this who have tools to help companies uh, do that risk assessment. Great, thank you very much, uh, Tim. And Chris, going back to you, um, OLAM reports uh, against non-financial capital such as natural capital in its, its annual reports. And this includes water impacts and dependencies. Could you explain this approach and also describe some of the actions and decisions that drives? Yeah, thanks, Tom. Um, so this is this is a relatively new area for for Olam. We've um, over the last few years, I've, I've really championed the need to to start thinking more holistically, um, and from a, from a systems perspective, I guess. And natural capital um, has, has been great to to allow us to to think about this. Again, different things are priorities in different parts of the business, um, but it gives us a, a common metric uh, to use. So for, for water, it's, it really has uh, required us to look at um, improving the traceability, uh, the understanding of, of where are all the products coming from. And this has been a huge piece of work within Olam over the last several years. Um, and again, digital solutions at, at the heart of this. Um, so identifying where materials are coming from at a granular level um, is, is, is fundamental to this. Uh, then understanding what are specific consumptions um, and being able to use um, third party databases to understand what's that ecosystem quality that's, that's been affected. Uh, so we're really moving beyond just the, the typical um, consumption of, of water or impacts on uh, on. Um, discharge uh, em emissions um, metrics um, so to thinking about the system that we're operating in with respect to water and um, that's also allowing us to, to I guess refocus uh, when looking at natural capital holistically um, and looking at the value 
of, of water as opposed to just a, con a unit of consumption. It puts a very different perspective on it. It makes us realize again the, the increased dependency level uh, that we have on, on water, the ecosystems uh, that, that we're part of. Uh, water can impact on either uh, using too much or, or putting back material that's, uh, that's contaminated. Within the natural capital accounting piece of work, we, we've then constructed a, a profit and loss uh, um, and are working to develop a balance sheet around this. And the balance sheet is going to be really interesting because that's going to require us to build in context-based targets for where we operate. So again, thinking about greenhouse gases, it's, it's nice and easy. Um, you, you just peg yourself uh, to the science-based targets process. But for water, you've really got to understand the context um, based approach and what that means in terms of our operations. So that's requiring, again, more research, more thought, um, and more bespoke accounting, and then more bespoke actions and management uh, associated with that. So we think this is going to take us down the pathway of just much more enhanced focus on water and the water-based ecosystems that we're part of, um, and also allows us a conversation then more broadly with other actors. So as, as Tim was saying as well, it's, we, there, it's not just about us. We've, we've got to be able to, to look at this more pre-competitively and bring in other people within those watersheds who are active uh, to really help us build collective action. If we can't do that, we're never going to solve the root causes of the challenges. Um, so we definitely do, through disclosure, need to move water into this pre-competitive uh, state uh, so we can really uh, demonstrate the business value of what it is we're doing. Great, thanks for that, Chris. And you teed up quite nicely um, our next topic on, on uh, targets, because we're going to talk about context and, and science-based targets. And, and Chris, I'll come back to you on this question. Um, I'll go to Tim next, but maybe you can think about a question we've had from the audience, which is, which is about wastewater and you know, this figure that 80% of, of wastewater is discharged into the environment without being treated. And some of that is used directly for agricultural purposes. Um, is this something that's on OLAM's radar as, as a risk, for example? I'll, I'll come back to you on that, on that question. Um, Tim, Chris started to talk about there where he wants to see this disclosure space move towards in, in terms of water. So from an investor perspective, I mean, how would you like to see this water disclosure space improve? And how do you think we can incentivize the widespread adoption of improved water related disclosure? Well, I mean, the first step we always talk about is just in order for this data and information to be commonly used, which we think it's essential for lots of reasons for it to be more commonly used, you need more ubiquitous disclosure. So, you know, the first step is always getting more, more common and, you know, regular and consistent reporting across companies around the world and on a more timely basis. So to me, it's actually just getting better at what we're already doing and, and having it more, uh, coming something that all companies are doing is the first step you know I the the amount of information really does come down to the company specifically and the sector they're in um, we do want to see targets we want to see something more than just reporting we want to see ideally you move up the ladder from a simple target to maybe net neutrality to actually a context-based target as Chris said because that's the ideal one um, because even net neutrality doesn't necessarily get you where you need to go right in certain safe cases um, maybe we need to go a lot further than neutral um, in terms of replenishing. So, and it all depends on the context and the basin and so on. So we're just looking for a deeper understanding. You know, we want to see that companies really understand where their risks are, where their opportunities are, and they understand how to structure their business so they won't run into those barriers, run into those risks, so they can continue to operate successfully for decades in the future within the communities they're needing, they're drawing water and impacting the water um, so that it's for us a better investment because we can feel like those risks are being properly handled. Great, thanks for that, Tim. And Chris, just coming back to you lastly on that question I posed before we went to Tim on, on the wastewater and the reuse in agriculture, is this something on OLAM's um, radar as a, as a risk? Yeah, I mean, the, the there's, there's lots of uh, there's lots of approaches um, that are being explored. Um, there's there's examples uh, across. Just think about our, our, some of our Californian operations and, and um, wastewater from uh, from spices processing factories, then being piped several kilometres off to to agricultural uh, usage. So 
again, we're, we're looking at, at where are the possibilities to, to close the loop? Um, how can we take lower grade water for use elsewhere? Um, so yeah, there's, there's a multitude of challenges um, that we're trying to get to the bottom of. Again, it's, it's a, I think the, the key thing is seeing that water is just a, a key resource. Um, and again, we're, we're active um, alongside many other uh, stakeholders within the landscape. Um, our processing operations are obviously also dependent on, on the growers. Um, so the processing side needs to realize that they, they need to look out for the growers that might be local or they might, they might be elsewhere. But really, what can we do? How can we innovate um, in this space is, is at the fore of our minds. Um, and in, in terms of just moving on from, again, picking up on Tim and targets and ambitions, I guess, um, the, the purpose outcome that we're really trying to deliver um, in Olam around water on the environmental side, not uh, forgetting about the human side, is around regenerating the living world. We know that we're going to have to, um, in certain landscapes, find ways to put more back than, than we're taking out. Um, and not just as Olam, but as everybody with, with the straws uh, sucking from the, from the same cup. And um, we're going to have to find ways to put more back um, in, in the short term. Um, and, and looking at different grades of water and how to reuse that, then definitely that's one of those. But yeah, many, many challenges are ahead. Um, and again, working collaboratively is going to be the, the most effective way of doing this. No one company can deliver this on their own. Uh, so again, looking at uh, organizations, be it WBCSD, looking at water stewardship through Alliance for Water Stewardship, or working in organizations like the California Water Action Collaborative. These are the ways that we hope OLAM will uh, be able to work with others and, and find the solutions or share solutions to, to get to the bottom of some of the root cause problems. Yeah. The other thing, Thanks, Chris. And, 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 and Tim, just quickly, if you want to yeah. come in. I, the other thing I think would be really helpful, and at some point we started doing this, is putting a, an internal price on water um, that they, you know, because we pricing matters. And I think for companies, too often the water is effectively free from a price perspective. So I think we'd like to see more of that happening and how that companies build that into their decision-making. Fantastic. And I think we'll hear a little bit more about water valuation during our, our next webinar uh, right. next week, particularly when we talk about collective action. But we need to leave it there for now. Thanks so much, Chris and Tim. We could have gone on for a, a lot longer on this topic. There are a few questions um, that are unanswered, um, which we'll come back to post uh, webinar with our uh, participants but thank you so much for your contribution and we're going to swiftly uh, move on to our next session and we already started to tee up some of this in terms of talking about science-based targets and, and context co context-based targets so we'll we'll dive into that now and I'll hand over to my colleague at WRI Sarah Walker who's going to take us through this next session Sarah over to you great thank you Tom um, as Tom said, I'm Sarah Walker. I'm a senior manager for agriculture and water quality at the World Resources Institute. And I'll be moderating <clears throat> this panel on water targets. So first, we're going to hear a little background on the evolution and landscape of this water target space from Tian Shao, who's a senior advisor for the UN Global Compact's CEO water mandate and senior researcher and corporate water stewardship co-lead with the Pacific Institute. And then we'll have two panelists, Truka Smor, Environmental and Sustainability Director for Water at Cargill, and Ian Knight, Global Sustainability Senior Manager at Mars. And they'll share their experiences with setting and implementing meaningful water targets. So first, TN, let me turn it over to you to say a few words and kick us off. Thank you, Sarah. Um, that was a great introduction. So today, as Sarah said, I will provide an overview of the evolution of corporate water targets and then go into brief detail on the existing approaches. Next slide, please. So as the previous uh, panel alluded to and talked about, water challenges are very context specific and unique to each catchment where companies operate. Therefore, corporate water targets must reflect the local conditions of the catchment to reduce water risk at the local level for the long-term, realize new opportunities, 
and contribute to overall water security and sustainability of that catchment. Next slide, please. There are two starting points for setting corporate water targets. The first is addressing water risk, and the other is to stay within a catchment's sustainable water thresholds. Setting targets to address catchment water risks ensures that the company performance has a positive impact on the environment, especially if it is addressed with stakeholders through collective action. And setting targets aligned with catchment thresholds ensures that the water users stay within sustainable freshwater systems and considers other linkages and trade-offs with environmental issues. Next slide, please. On the left, for addressing water risks, there are several guidances for companies to set contextual water targets. This includes the Site Water Targets Guide informed by catchment context and the case studies in the Santa Ana in California, in India, and also in South Africa. There will be a guide to set enterprise water targets informed by catchment context coming out later this year. And so both the science, so, so the science-based targets for water really combines the left, um, the private sector risk reduction lens, and also the need to stay within the sustainable thresholds. And the definition of science-based targets for water is building on existing work, but providing additional rigor, ensuring that the targets focus on water quality and quantity thresholds and based on the best available hydrological science for both surface and groundwater. Next slide, please. So this slide shows, is another way to show the evolution of corporate water targets where the next generation of corporate water targets are moving beyond internal benchmarking um, and ensuring that context is incorporated. So the middle area, contextual water targets, is focused on the right things, such as the water challenges, which water challenges within SGG6 in the right places, so basins facing high water stress and or basins with the shared water challenges. The science-based targets for water at the, at the bottom here focuses on quality and quantity and also in the right place, but also at the right level where targets are incorporating the latest science and also the allocation of res responsibility within that catchment. And this is from uh, the WWF uh, website. So I will go through two approaches now, the setting of contextual water targets and here is a definition of what a site level target is reflecting the catchment context. There are two main things to focus on here. One is addressing the priority water challenges, but also um, understanding and supporting the desired catchment condition. And so here on the right is a catchment where a site is located and there's multiple water uses in the catchment and interrelated water challenges. Here as well. Next slide, please. So for the setting contextual water targets, there are three steps at the site. The first is really understanding the site's water use, including its dependencies and impacts, and the priority water challenges within the catchment. Once that priority water challenge is determined, the second step is to determine that desired condition of that priority water challenge. It could be a goal of water depletion or a threshold around water quality as a desired condition. And a gap will be assessed between the current and desired conditions. And the site can then determine its contribution towards that desired condition. The second step really helps a site determine the ambition or the magnitude of the target. And then the third step is to ensure that the target aligns with existing water stewardship initiatives and efforts, including public policy initiatives. So it contributes to existing efforts. And it also has implementation measures to measure progress towards the target. So there's existing guidances um, for this that uh, companies can refer to, and we'll hear more 
um, later on with Cargo and Mars on more applications and practicalities on, on how to do this. And the final slide for me is the science-based target network uh, for, uh, for nature is um, building on the science-based targets initiative focused on climate change and companies, but expanding now to nature and cities in addition to companies. This mission is a global economy in which companies and cities operate within environmental boundaries on a socially equitable basis through the setting of science-based targets to reduce their impact. So those who are interested in getting more involved or understanding the development of the method of science-based targets for water, there's a website link here, but you can also get in contact with us. So let me hand it back to Sarah um, to moderate the rest of the panel. Great, thank you so much, Tian. That's really useful background. Um, if anyone has questions for Tian, feel free to type them into the Q&A um, and that'll go for our uh, panelists as well. And we can try to get to them at the end or we'll respond offline after the webinar. Um, for now, let's invite our panelists to introduce themselves and the companies they represent. So, Truka, let's start with you. Yes, thank you, Sarah. So, uh, I'm Truka Smore. I'm the Global Water Lead uh, for Cargo and I'm responsible for the water program for our operations and our supply chains. So, for those of you who don't know Cargo, Cargo is a food and agriculture company and um, we quite a large company, so it's always difficult to grab what we do in one t sentence, but it's about like we, we connect, so we connect to nourish the world in a safe, responsible and sustainable way. That's kind of what our purpose is. But when we connect, we connect farmers with markets, we can connect customers with ingredients and people and animals with the food they need to try it. Uh, some key numbers, um, like Olam, we also work in uh, roughly around 70 countries. Uh, we have uh, 160,000 employees and we already exist for more than 150 years and we hope to uh, continue that for uh, uh, much, much longer. Um, key areas we focus on, uh, as I said, like agriculture, but also animal nutrition and protein and food and food ingredients. Great. Thanks, Druka. Ian? Yeah, hi, everybody. Uh, Ian Knight. I'm based in the UK. I'm part of Mars's corporate sustainability team. I lead on water stewardship. Mars is a global confectionery, food and uh, pet care business. Wonderful. Thank you both for joining us. So um, as we heard from Tien, um, we know that creating meaningful water use goals grounded in science is really a key first step in trying to mitigate water risks across global supply chains. And both of your companies have really taken um, a context-based approach to doing this. So Mars has set context-based goals to ensure water use along its value chain is within annually renewable levels specific to each watershed in which Mars operates and sources from. Um, and you're developing some more ambitious water intensity targets in areas of high water stress where you have facilities. Um, Cargill aims to achieve sustainable water management in all their priority watersheds across their operations and supply chains by 2030. So these are both very impressive uh, and ambitious goals. Can you briefly, within a few minutes, just kind of share your journey? How did you get to where you are today? And what lessons, um, building blocks from previous milestones in, in the water world enabled you and really drove you to set your context-based targets? Shall I start? Sure, Ian, go ahead. Yeah, so I, I liked Tian's inverted pyramid showing the journey for water targets because that was pretty pretty much reflects uh, Mars's approach. In 2010 we set our first water target which was to reduce our water usage at our factories at our sites by 25 percent and uh, we quickly realized that, uh, that that was a very coarse sort of target. In some locations a 25 percent reduction was nothing like enough and in other places you know there was absolutely no need to, uh, to reduce water use. So we, we then kind of moved on and we set a, a more of a, of a, a site specific target to improve efficiency. Um, 
But at the same time, we also realise that uh, our, the planet doesn't really care about efficiency, it cares about absolutes. And we, we set uh, back in 2010 a, a carbon uh, reduction target that was absolute, that was founded in science and the trajectory needed uh, to, um, to uh, around a two degree future. And um, Mars playing its share of the, uh, or solving its share of the problem. And so we brought that thinking into water. You know, how should Mars solve its share of the problem in the places where water is stressed? And, um, and also realizing that as an agricultural business, more than 99% of our water use is in agriculture, not in our factories. So broadening our thinking to our entire uh, value chain. And, and so that, that kind of led as, a, as an evolutionary process that when we relaunched our, our transformational targets for our entire value chain, we had a water target that was um, aimed at just doing that, at uh, meeting Mars's share of the, the problems uh, associated with water in the locations where we're operating where those problems apply. Great, thank you, Ian. Trika? Yeah, and uh, I very, very much recognize some of the points you make, uh, Ian, but I think for Cargill, um, what was really key to how we developed uh, our strategy and how we landed at our targets is, is prioritization is key and prioritization is needed. Like given uh, the size of all the different regions that we source from and the huge impact of water, we just had to prioritize knowing that location matters. And so I think that was kind of the key starting point to say is like, well, we have to prioritize to be able to really focus on where can we drive change, where can we make that difference and where can, where can we com contribute. So I think that was, that was one key is that like taking a context-based approach helped us to, to prioritize and to focus. Um, the other part for us is really the taking a holistic approach. So when like many companies, we also came from a, from a, from a legacy and history of efficiency targets. Uh, however, like Ian said, like they're not driving the change that we needed. And you also see is that um, like water quality and is so important for our supply chains, for our operations, for our communities. And um, we through including taking a more holistic approach by including not only water quality, water availability, but also access to safe drinking water. We really could look at it with, from the different angles that are important for us, like leveraging the synergies that we see through with climate change, through the role of, of, of nitrogen and nitrous oxides on one hand to climate change, but then also through runoff to water quality, leveraging uh, access to safe drinking water to make sure that we have resilient communities in the regions that we source from and having uh, all of that integrated in our approach again, emphasize the need to take that context-based approach and prioritize on those key priority regions that are the most relevant for us and where we have that ability to drive change. Great, thanks, Truka. Um, Ian, as you mentioned, Mars has really a vast assortment of raw materials that you source from um, ingredients for chewing gum to dog food. So how are you thinking about prioritizing um, your efforts? Well, we have three steps. Firstly, every year we ask our procurement teams to report what it is that we're buying, uh, where it's coming from, and how much we're, we're, we're purchasing. And we try to get that as granular as possible, and we record it in a geographic information system. So I like what Chris was saying about, about needing to develop bespoke accounting methods for water, because that's very much what we're, what we're doing. And secondly, uh, we uh, assess what the water risks are that are, are, are impacting these locations that we're actually operating in. And there we use uh, global data sets for, for both water stress, but also for uh, agricultural uh, crop land use. And we put this information together to actually understand what the water sort of picture actually is that are facing us, you know, in these particular locations. And then finally, we calculate how much water we're using and how much water we need to reduce by actually in those locations. And the great benefit of actually this approach is exactly as Truka said, in terms of prioritization, 
because what what we what we find out then is that 78 percent of the unsustainable water that we're using in our value chain is associated with three commodities in four that are sourced from four locations so for us it's rice for uncle ben, our uncle ben's rice brand it's broken rice that we use in our pet food brands and it's mint from our wrigley chewing gum operations that are sourced from just four countries india pakistan spain and the united states so it really helps us to to, to, to simplify our global supply chain from a water perspective into working on the, the impacts that are, are really most material to us, which associated with those limit, relatively limited number of locations and, and materials. Great, thank you. Very, very clear. Um, and Trika, similarly for, for Cargill, Cargill has a massive supply chain across the globe um, and you simply can't start out trying to have everyone do everything everywhere. Um, you have to prioritize, as you mentioned. So could you just walk us a bit more through how you ensure that when you set your targets, you're really driving the right action uh, in the right places? Yeah, and, and I think there's there are many, many aspects. So, and I think this is a topic we can talk like, like for hours about, but I think where it really starts with is like finding the right direction, like keeping, like prioritizing step by step and starting with what you already know, because it's in a way you're very much tempted to say, I need to fully map my entire supply chain and need to know from every ingredient exactly where I source it from and then identify what the local associated water issues are. And then you just doing the impossible. And so what we're, we started is saying, well, your first step is really understanding where in your value chain do you have the highest highest impact or the highest associated footprint. And that's not rocket science. Like we know the role of agriculture. You know there like there are global data sets that at least give you an indirection of which crops have an associated footprint. And then we worked really closely with with WRI with you to just identify, like overlay those with, well, where is water an issue? And then we zoomed in on those three, issues, three aspects that were critical for us being the water availability, water quality, and access to safe drinking water. And then saying, well, that already pins it down because now we can only have to look at where water is an issue and then focus on, so what do we know from these specific regions? And then zooming in on these specific regions, actually looking at, well, what is, what is uh, our contribution or our associated footprint to these issues? And by taking that approach, by really only like zooming in at the level where we knew that there was an issue, we could step by step, actually indeed, like similar to Ian saying like, well, we started, I think with over 6,000 watersheds that we were looking at and we were able to bring it down to something that was far below 100 to just say like, well, this is what really pinpoints us where we can drive change and where we can, can really like uh, make the difference that we want to make, but also where we uh, where we see uh, the, both the risk and the opportunities for us. Great, thank you. Um, Ian, let me come back to you. We have a question from a participant um, who would like you to elaborate more on efficiency versus absolute targets. And then I was wondering if you could just say a few words about moving on to implementation. So of course, setting the target is the first milestone um, and, and a critical piece of this, but then how do we go beyond that um, and engage suppliers and others to ultimately attain um, these targets? Yeah, no, thank you. I mean, efficiency versus absolute, I mean, that's, uh, that's a big discussion uh, internally, um, particularly when, when it comes to talking to, to factories, you know, they, they talk about, well, we have some control over our efficiency, but our absolute footprint it's very much driven by what we're asked to make, which is kind of outside of our control. So the factories kind of prefer to have efficiency targets rather than absolute targets. Whereas, you know, the planet really doesn't care about our efficiency. It compares about our absolute impacts. You know, and we, if we double our efficiency, it's great. But if we quadruple our output, you know, we're having more of a, of a detrimental impact. So we, we, we regard water in the same way as carbon with regard to, to absolutes. And we're, we're very much migrating more towards absolute targets than, than, than efficiency. When it comes to implementation, um, we're, we're aware of a few uh, deficiencies with our, with our, our lagging in uh, KPI. Uh, particularly, it takes a long time 
to develop implementation programs and intervention programs that make a difference to our water performance. So if you want to, to, to start a sustainable agricultural uh, program in a particular location, maybe working with, with external partners, it can take a number of years to bring it to fruition. And it's very much the responsibility of the procurement community to actually to do that. And some of the, uh, the career trajectories of, uh, of uh, procurement managers are such that perhaps they're not going to be around for long enough to actually see the, the results of the, the work that they, they initiate, you know, which perhaps is a disincentive you know, to them to initiate it in the first place. So we kind of realise that and we, we very see a, particularly a role for leading KPIs to complement lagging KPIs to ensure that there's a sufficiency of action programmes being developed and approved that are going to make a difference to the lagging indicator in the future. Uh, and so well, that's, that's one of the, the areas we've particularly been working on to, to, to deploy within the, the procurement community. And then, of course, you know, we have a number of, of, of uh, intervention programmes that we're proud of, particularly those where we're working broadly with a range of external uh, kind of organisations, maybe governments, NGOs, uh, certification bodies to make a difference. And uh, WAPRO would be one of those that, that people are welcome to, uh, to Google that's, uh, that's, uh, uh, that's run by Helvetus and supported by the Swiss government that we, uh, we work with some of our rice farmers in India and Pakistan on. Great, thank you. Um, Trugo, one more question for you before I uh, ask a closing question to you both so we can try to wrap up here by, by noon. Um, you mentioned your focus on water quality and wash in addition to some of the more typical um, water risks looking at quantity. So I was wondering if you could just say a quick word about um, why you decided to look at these shared water challenges that haven't received as much attention traditionally, um, particularly by the corporate sector. So I think where, uh, why we include those is because it's, it's really uh, part of, of I would say our our values and where we stand for as as cargo and our role in the in in the value chain. So for us, our connection with our farmers, growers, and rangers is really critical. And so we also see that by taking this holistic approach and including water quality, water quality is something that really is close to the farmer's mind. This really resonates with them. And this is even uh, often an easier talking point than talking, talking about climate and, and greenhouse gas emissions, because it's something that they see directly. They see it in their water quality. They see it in the regulations that they face. And therefore, because of the synergies, as I already talked about, like the synergies that exist with uh, greenhouse gas emissions, especially in agriculture, we can, by combining those, uh, actually like benefit and have, have like have multiple benefits from from the interventions and the key example actually is is one of the projects we're currently doing in Iowa and it's together with the Soybean Growers Association where uh, through combining greenhouse gas and water quality we can actually create incentives for farmers based on a market-based approach that uh, actually feed that that benefits back to the farmer and together they uh, can go hand in hand and make it easier to actually achieve those benefits both on water quality and on climate, which are so much needed and both are critical to, to be achieved. If you then look at uh, access to water, um, as it is so critical for our communities and we just see it as needed to do our part and ensure that all people have access to safe drinking water aligned with the sustainable development goals. And again, taking that context-based approach just makes sense because uh, it helps us focus on saying, this is where we have a unique position and where we can drive change and therefore include that as part of how we operate. Wonderful, thank you. Okay, uh, one final question for you both. Uh, what would be your primary piece of advice to your peers who are interested in getting started on this um, target setting journey for water? but maybe haven't gotten started yet or um, are struggling a bit along the way. And you could keep it to like 30 seconds, that'd be great. Yeah, so three points, I think. Build understanding of your supply chain, understand your impacts, use imperfect data, you know, don't let the uh, perfect be the enemy of the good. Um, set, set your priorities, uh, set targets to make a difference to those uh, priorities uh, and engage a critical friend. Organisations like WWF, WRI, Series, 
I can greatly help, you know, to as to be informed and uh, a helpful sort of uh, uh, provocation to you as you as you take the journey. Yeah, that gives me my 30 seconds. So I would say, like, take embrace that context based approach. It is a next level, but it really actually makes things easier. So look really at focus on where you can drive change across your value chain and it, be holistic, but don't be perfect. Very often start with what you already know and and build on that. There are so many things that need to be done and that can be done. Like the moment that you open the tap and you cannot drink it, the moment that your rivers run dry, the moments that you have you close down your facilities because you simply don't have a supply, you know that there is an issue and you don't need to spend years and years of risk assessments to find out what the, what the issue is. You can already start today and the people on the ground will know and uh, use them to drive action and change where you can. Great. Thank you both very much. We'll have to close there. Um, as you can all see, this has really been an exciting and, and rapidly developing space. So I hope this um, conversation was useful and helpful um, for everyone on the line. And feel free to reach out to us if you want more information about um, anything we talked about today. So following this webinar, as Tom mentioned, we will share the slides and we'll share the recording. And we can also um, share some answers to the Q&A questions. I see a lot of really good questions coming in. I'm sorry we didn't have time to get to them, but we will, um, we will respond via email. And then finally, let me just close by inviting you all to join us next week at the same time for our third and final webinar in the series, which will focus on standards and collective action. Um, and with that, on behalf of WBCSD and Ceres and WRI, thank you all for joining us today and hopefully we'll see you next week. Thanks very much to all of our panelists.